I use, it's like my gate evaluation, uh, but it's not anything that tells you definitive information. So if you're gonna do the lunge, we're not gonna show it in this course, but my preferred one is the inline lunge. No one knows what that is though. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm just testing that, that's my favorite one. I've got like a weird sort of quick one that we can do um, in the squat to make sure that they have sufficient dorsiflexion range of motion. Uh, if they've got some trunk things going on, what are we going to do? We think there's some instability here. Which tests are we going to use? Three months. Three months. Three months seated assessments. The three month diaphragm or the supine diaphragm test. We can do that. You could do quadruped. You could do bear. You can go back and sort of see those things. The the one that gives you the good data is are, are the, the two that give you the good data are the, the seated evaluation and the, the supine and abdominal pressure test. So then you can tell, can they actually activate there and what's going on, does that make sense? Okay. So, if we have her, just go ahead and face me. So she's getting ready. Um, you can, you only want to observe the plane that you're looking at. So what plane am I looking at right now? You're perpendicular to the plane that you're, I said, I, I stood here to mess with you all, but I'm standing in the sagittal plane, technically I'm standing in the transverse plane, but I'm looking at, think of it, you're looking at a pane of glass. So the pane of glass right now is coronal, right? So the reason for that is the axes of rotation in the plane that they occur are perpendicular to it. So the sagittal plane axis, where's the PVC pipe? Where's my, I'll just pull it. There you go. So this, you got to see there. So if she leans to the left, go for it. No, no, just lateral flexion. This is the axis, it's perpendicular to this. Come back up. So now if she does a hip hinge, go ahead, hip hinge. Here's the axis, what plane is this? Sagittal plane, right? So then, if she were to rotate, this would be this. So the axis of rotation is perpendicular to the plane. So you always want to be only paying attention, maybe taking note of, but only pay attention to things that are happening in the plane you're looking at. So can I see if she has good dorsiflexion from here when she squats? Maybe a little bit. Not really is a good answer. Can I see it from here? Maybe ish. Can I see it from here? Yeah. Yes. Um, can I see a butt weight from here? No. Maybe sort of ish. Yeah, the answer is not really. Can I see it from the side? Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm standing here, can I see a lateral shift? No. Maybe. But you just want to pay attention to that. So if I'm standing, looking at the coronal plane, what are the things that we can see in a squat test? You could see a pelvis shift. You could see the knees coming in or out. You could see the, the foot loading. Do they collapse into pronation or not? Um, we also just sort of have to infer the transverse plane, right? You're not no one's, so although the baseball stuff that they have, is a, it's like, ugh. Um, so from here, I'm gonna look at, of course, the abdominal strategy. When she turns around, I'll look at her the back, you know, torso stabilizing strategy. I'm gonna kind of not even worry about like the, up, all the other stuff, the shoulder blades, are they carrying all that, it matters, but I just wanna focus on the gross mechanics of, of the squat here. Um, so I'm gonna watch the strategy first is using in the belly, and I just kind of work down. Then I'll look at the hip, is there a shift? Um, then I go down farther, is there a <coughs> knee problem? And then we're gonna see what's happening in the foot. Now, so don't move. I would bet right now a small airplane that her right hip is the more dysfunctional, is that correct? What do you guys see? Her right foot is more externally rotated than her left foot. That is a very, very consistent pattern. Enough that when I go work with Olympic weightlifters, the test that I use to see which hip is more unstable is three just successively higher ones. I'm gonna just stop. And whichever one, which side do you think is of mine is more dysfunctional? Right, right. My right side. So, when you see somebody that's standing there and they have 
their foot's naturally turned out. Or you'll see Olympic weightlifters and they'll catch and one is turned out more. It's usually the side that's more dysfunctional. So the cars on that side would be a little bit more limited. Her motor control and perception on that side's less. She probably doesn't turn to the right that way. Um, she probably has limited Dorsey flux on that side. She probably has a tougher time pistoling on that side. Maybe, is that all, is all correct? Don't ever do that, by the way. We'll make one observation to do it, but it's consistent enough that I wanted to just kind of bring it up. So, uh, why don't we do, uh, everybody go on that side so that I can, we can be looking at the same thing. So come, come over here a little bit. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so now, for her, if her feet are a little wider than I might want, but I'm not, it's not like enough that I'm gonna go, oh, bring your feet in. If she got set up like this, I'm gonna tell her to bring her feet in. If you have someone that doesn't know it, like squat off, they're just kind of stand like that, and be like, okay, squat down, they're just like, it happens all the time, they don't know. You wanna cue them as little as possible, you wanna get something, but she's fine, she knows how to squat. What is she gonna do with her arms? I don't know, I'm just gonna let her do it. I'm not gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna be here and then hold them like this and squat. At the same time, you'll oftentimes have people like, I'll have somebody go ahead and squat and they're like, and they're doing like the CrossFit level one squat. I'm like, whoa, 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 just squat. Don't worry about it. So I'm just gonna have her just squat down. We're gonna pay attention to belly first. So just go ahead. Good. You can go on there. So now if you watch, I have to ask you to move your hands apart so you can see the belly. Sure, go for it. Good. So we might be seeing a little bit of divoting here, a little bit of activity there, maybe a little bit too much going this way, so pressure in the belly. But if the belly is coming out too far this way, where is it not going? Back. It's not pushing against the spine, so she might have more activity in the back, which I would bet. Right? Join the club, right? Okay, so cool. So there's the belly. Maybe a little bit here, she's leaner, but a little bit of divot in here. I'm not seeing her rectus kind of grab. A lot of times you would see right on the, the, the umbilical line above that, you're gonna have hypertonicity there, right? That's, that's sort of like what we call hourglassing syndrome. Um, a lot of times you'll see wrinkles in here. She doesn't even have them, which means she's not holding her belly in all the time, cool. So now, let's just pay attention to the pelvic shift. So just go ahead and you have your hands back where they were. Nice and easy. Now, we can't, of course, see a lot of the pelvic shift here. I'm not seeing a ton of a shift. So now what I would do to keep going, I then always step in line with the, with the foot so I can then see what's happening with the knee. So go ahead. We want the knee to track lateral to the big toe. If it's Past the big toe, not past the little toe, I don't really care, but really second or third toe is ideal. Go ahead, keep going. And she's a little bit more valgus on this side, it's not screamingly bad. If we now then go and look at the foot, I'm not seeing a ton going on there. I'm kind of looking to see what does the medial longitudinal arch do. Is it collapsing a ton? She's not over gripping. So that's actually pretty good. So the, what we're seeing is up. All that I'm seeing right now from the front is a little bit of valgosity in the knee, not screamingly bad, maybe a little bit more on this side than this side. That's it. That's not like, that's like, in, in your clinic, you're just moving on to the next one. So now, let's go ahead and face the other way. And now we'll be able to see if there's a, a pelvic shift, you can see um, what's going on in the back, which we can already kind of see that here. And then we can, you can see the knees, but the, the sub tailor joint in the back is really, really good to see. So just go ahead and move the block. Yep, so now we can see it. So, so now, which way is she collapsing? Anybody? Mm -hmm. To the right. So she's collapsing to the right, okay? You stop saying. So, here's a little, uh, tidbit, you will collapse, collapse towards instability and you will move away from hypomobility. So if she's unstable, so you just walk down, you can the shoulders. 
If she squats down, she's gonna collapse this way. So keep going. She'll collapse like this. If I give her a dorsiflexion problem, so go ahead, you can use me because you're gonna kind of want to fall. And I give her a dorsiflexion problem, see how her pelvis has to go the other way? I'm basically blocking forward translation of her knee, so she has to go like this. So she's getting pushed away from instability, as, sorry, from, from a lack of mobility on this side, or she collapsed towards the instability. In this case, go so stand back up. Because we know she's got the foot turned out here, we're suspecting that she's got a little bit more instability on this side. We see a little bit more valgosity on this knee when she's squatting, and then the bigger side, as you can see, her pelvis drifting that way when she squats. Can you all see that? Give, it, go ahead, give us like three or four squats. You guys see that? And it's not extremely bad, so maybe it's a little bit too detailed. I'll just, just believe me here, but you'll, you'll see it's a subtle point. So that just looks really bad. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, scroll ahead. Right there. So she, you see her kind of go this way. Like that. Now, um, the other one that we can see, when she squats down, go ahead, you'll see the back kind of right there, kind of cranks on a little bit. So she's using a little more erectors than we want. Come back up. Um, now, the things that I'm seeing the most I noted when I was looking at the coronal plane, they're more sagittal plane issues. So go ahead and uh, here's the, here's the right there, just that way. Um, so now what, we, what, what can we look at here? Dorsiflexion, hip flexion, spine angle, rib position, pelvis motion. You can see all those things from this angle. Okay? So with her, I noticed that she's you know, quickly diving back like that. I don't know if that's because how she's taught or if she has a limit in dorsiflexion. We'll figure it out in a second. Go ahead and squat. So, let's keep going. 25 more. So I always look, I stand right lateral of the foot to see the dorsiflexion. Now, if the squat, is an end range, it's like end range dorsiflexion and end range hip flexion. Um, from here, we're seeing a little bit of a butt wink at the bottom of the squat, right? So with that, I don't honestly think it's from a limited range of motion. I think it's because when she starts the motion, what does she do? She arches her back a little bit. What is that at the hip? Flexion. So how much hip flexion do you need to get below parallel? 110, 120, depending on your morphology. How much hip flexion do people typically have? 110, 120. So to get below parallel, if she tilts her pelvis forward, I'll demo this in the squat, if she tilts her pelvis forward and then she squats down, she's gonna have a bigger butt weight and they'll start sooner, okay? Go ahead and come back up. Now on the topic of the butt wing, Butt winking, good or bad? I mean, you don't, it doesn't depend, you don't want a butt wink, you yeah. can abort it. But like, are we worried about a butt wink in, a, in an air squat? No, no. Are we worried about a butt wink if they're doing 500 air squats? Yes. Yeah. Probably, right? So what are the factors that go into a disc herniation? So, yeah, you're thinking too specifically. Load? So if they go into a butt wink with air squat, do we care? If they go into a butt wink with 600 pounds on their back, do we care? Yes. Yes, load. The other one is duration. If they hold that for 10 minutes, right, it might aggravate it. The other one is magnitude, how much of a butt wink. And the last one is speed. And the speed, there's kind of two factors to it. One of them is if you're dropping into the hole more quickly, you have more inertia, and so then there's more total torque going through the body. The other one is if you're moving very quickly, it's hard to like maintain good stability, okay? Um, so the butt wink, the answer is we would like to not have one, but if they start the butt wink at, ideally below, but at or below parallel, it doesn't matter to me because the magnitude is going to be very, very minimal. If they started above parallel, now the magnitude is pretty significant, 
the amount of time their inflection is going to be more, and that's where I want to start correcting their butt wink. But if somebody walks in, like if she does, they go ahead and face that way again. This is a normal nice squat right there. So she's at slightly below parallel when she starts it. Doesn't bother me. Okay. Um, Dorsi flexion. So for that, um, go ahead and, and keep your whole foot loaded and squat all the way down. Pull your squat down. Good. Now keep your feet flat and, and push the left knee forward as far as you can. Good. Bring it back. Push the right knee forward as far as you can. Good. So she has, she has to sort of collapse. Just go straight forward like that. Straight forward. Back. Straight forward. So see how she has, you guys probably can't see it. You feel like you have way more on this side. She can keep her foot down farther to come back up. You want to support them because no, sorry. <laughs> you want to support them just like them. <laughs> um, because they need to come down here, but what you're doing, now, uh, so, hold on, support me. I'm going to show the squat down and then keep the feet flat, push the knee forward. The moment my knee, my heel comes off the ground, there's my, my little like quick test. You so should your knees go past your toes? Yes. Yes. Okay. So in a squat, you sh you need to be able to get your knees. For most people, their morphology it's about say one to three inches, about two inches. It needs to go past the toes. You want to have way more dorsiflexion, like that girl Chelsea. I think she was, her toe, an inline lunge, she's eight inches from the wall. And she can keep her heel on the ground and just put her knee there. So why is that good? Gives her more options. So there's an inverse relationship between shin angle and spine angle, okay? So if we have her squat down and we say, just push your knees forward, she can, her torso is gonna be more upright. Now you can support me if you need to. And I'm gonna push your knees vertical. So just let your shins vertical. Shins vertical. You can use me, you can shins vertical. You can come up, lift your butt up. But like keep your shins vertical. She has to hinge a ton. That didn't work. That, that demo didn't work. Come back up. <laughs> so you support me. So if I come down here, knees forward, very vertical spine. If I bring my shins vertical, then I want to stay balanced. Now I have to flatten my spine out. So you have a question? Yes. What's, what's the proper pattern? So the proper pattern is, Here? yeah, you want to, I think your knees should go about one to two inches past your toes on a normal squat. If you wear Olympic lifting shoes, or as the weight gets heavier, now the center mass of this thing that you're moving, barbell and the body, changes. And the squat is an end range exercise for dorsiflexion and for hip flexion which is why it feels like they're gonna fall over and your base of support is like this long. So if you have limited dorsiflexion, you can't really move your center of mass very far. You have no options to move it forward. So because of a lack of dorsiflexion, your center of mass, as you get closer to parallel, shifts backwards and that's where they feel like they're gonna fall. If you have limited hip flexion range of motion, you can at least compensate with spinal flexion. If you lack dorsiflexion, the center of mass just shifts backwards, right? So where the problem ends up happening is for, for what's the, if you're an Olympic weightlifter, what's the advantage of pushing your knees past your toes? Like you got Olympic lifting shoes on, you're squatting, your knees are way forward. What's the advantage? Get further under the bar. Vertical spine, easier to load, okay? So if you're lifting really heavy weights, like Donnie Shankle coming out of the hole, you know, with 400 pounds, 400 plus pounds at 230, you know, he's actually, the, his position was freaking gorgeous, but you can see if they push the knees forward, now they're able to maintain the stiffness of the spine because you reduce the torque, the bending torque on the torso, instead of being here, lots of bending torque, now they're here, not a lot of bending torque. But what's the compromise? Where did that torque go? Into the knee. So now the farther the knee goes forward, the more torque is going through the knee. Sorry, torque is rotational force about an axis, right? So how hard is, is that joint 
being turned, being bent. So the farther your knee goes forward, the more gravity has the mechanical positioning to create torque in the knee. So now your knee has to work harder because it's past the toes. That's why rehab people say don't go past the toes. But in reality, like, should we be able to go past the toes? Absolutely. Do we want the knees to go past the toes at times when you're doing a max clean and the, the thing that's going to fail is the stiffness of your trunk? So if I have a choice between this or this, I'm taking this every day and twice on Sundays. But what happens is if you're always squatting with your knees as far forward as possible, you know, you'll watch Olympic weightlifters and they'll have the bar and they're just, they're doing this, practicing that, it's too much load on the, on the knees. So I actually train Olympic weightlifters to not let their knees go much past their toe. I do that with a box. I don't do it with a wall. Why do I not do it with a wall? Just so the wall doesn't want the dorsal flexion to happen, right? We like that. But what does the, doll, the wall also not let happen? You can't keep the torso centrated. So if I get here, the wall blocks my knees. If I want to keep going, I have to do this. If I have a plyo box, and I, oh, thanks. Um, so if I have a plyo box and I have it like two inches past the knees, now I'll go ahead and I have her squat, find the box, but then just keep squatting. Good, and then just sort of sit, come back up. And I can have her find the box about two inches apart. Now she's able to keep her torso centrated, but we can now control the knee, come back up. I do this more with front squats, because front squats are more vertical, so they're more likely to push their knees forward, especially if they have shoes on. So the answer to the knee issue is you want, the knee should, in all scenarios, unless you're doing a low bar back squat, where you don't want the knee to go very far forward so that you can load the hips more. In all scenarios, at parallel, the knee should go like one to two inches past the toe for almost every single person. But you would like the ability, the option, to go past that if you want, but you don't want to do that every rep. You kind of want to distribute the load amongst the, the knee, the hip, and the spine. Now, if you get to really heavy loads where the spine stiffness is going to fail, then go ahead and, and buy a little bit of, um, take some of that cheat with your dorsiflexion to get the spine into a better position, it's fine. Just every rep, don't be jamming your knees as far forward as possible. But they should, even at light weights, be going about one to two inches past the toe every time. The reason squatting is tough for a lot of people is the inline lunge, how much, how many, um, how far past their toes can an inline lunge get, most people get? one to two inches. They can barely get just enough to squat right. You know, if you have an inline lunge like Chelsea and she can get eight inches from the wall, she's not worried even a tiny bit that she's gonna fall over because she's got options. She can go way more dorsiflexion or way less, but, because I don't want her walking around with the telephemoral issues all day long because she was a competitive Olympic weightlifter. We had to train her how to keep her knees more in check there. But that's the knee issue, yeah. When does the, is that the same as the patella gain pulled out of the patella grow by the uh, quads? In terms of when that, when Probably that, not, so okay. the, the groove is there. Yeah. What you're saying is lateral, you're saying patella femoral tracking stuff. Yeah. What I'm saying is the, the quad, so the patella is called a sesamoid bone, it's within the tendon. The harder the quads contract, the greater the compression of the patellofemoral joint. The greater the compression there, the more you know, friction, the more you're wearing down the cartilage, the more likely you have osteochondromalacia um, in the back of the patella. So if you're constantly squatting with your knees four inches past your toes with heavy, heavy weight, at some point you're going to get patellofemoral stuff. So if you can kind of keep the whole foot loaded, minimize how far it goes past, even though it needs to go past every rep, but not going all the way there, you're gonna kind of equally distribute the work amongst the knee, the hip, and the spine, as opposed to putting all of that work in the, in the knee and having minimal in the hip and the spine. Does that make sense? And 
uh, with West Side, they with the chin vertical as possible. That's basically taking the pressure out of the knee and then putting it more. It's way on the less. Spot. It's a hinge squat. And yeah. So if I have somebody that has knee problems and they still need to squat, what do I do? I teach them how to low bar back squat. Um, but the low bar back squat is kind of funny with with so it is. It is a, a strategy that is used, was mainly used and developed and is best optimized with equipped lifting. So a suit, they're Kevlar, I don't think they make denim ones anymore, but they're, you can tow an 18 wheeler with these things. I'm not joking, you can take a suit, wrap it around a ball uh, and like literally tie it to an 18 wheeler and you could tow the 18 wheeler with a suit. It's no joke. So they put these things on and the only way to get the like energy from the suit. It's, an it's, a, it's a super tight, elastic, you know, think of it as like crazy tight, you know, biker shorts, because they kind of come up over the top here. Insanely tight. And the amount of energy that you get out of them, so it's, it's tension times distortion. So what's the tension times the percentage of distortion is the mechanical energy that you get back. If you want to get more out of the suit, you want to bend the suit, stretch the suit as much as possible. That is done with a low bar back squat. If you're lifting without equipment, I don't see the utility in doing a, a perfectly vertical one. You can do a low bar or what we were talking about before, I think a medium bar placement and you want to use some of your knees because like your quads are strong. Why would we take those out of the movement? And so I think a lot of times that the low bar back squat gets erroneously thrown into raw lifting, when in reality, I don't think it's the best strategy for raw lifting. Okay. That, did I just answer the question I wanted to answer? Did I answer your yeah. question? <laughs> Harshly. West side is trying to load the hips. Yeah. West side does not do any raw training. They're not okay. any raw, raw competing. So my point is, long story short, it's a completely different sport. They're not even the same. So if you're wearing equipment, it's not the same as not wearing equipment. So if you do vertical shin and you don't have a suit on, I think you're leaving a lot of a lot of force just out there that you could be using to come from your knees a little bit. Doesn't Westside say though, even if it is vertical, that your quad's still activating the same as if it wasn't if it if you were tracking it over your second Basic third. biomechanics, it's not happening. Okay. It's like they're active for sure. Especially if you've got 3,000 pounds or whatever they have on their back. Um, but no, there's just literally, and by, the, by the third day of engineering school, you would know that that's not happening. Okay. Like you can't. If it's vertical like this, the moment arm that they have to actually produce torque in the knee is tiny. If you push the knee forward, it's massive. So like they're on, but they're not on as much as they would be with the knees forward. That is a hip biased squat, which is great. If you have knee problems, it's great. If you have patellofemoral, actually, another argument for why it's not on, then if that's the case, why do my patellofemoral tracking people or my patellofemoral condom relation patella people have no pain when I have low bar back squat? If the quad's on the same, why does it not hurt? It's because the quad's not on the same. So that is a, a hip dominant squat pattern, which is cool, but for DNS, we want to be distributing the work amongst all the tissues, so we would want the knees to come one to two inches past the toes. Because you've been waiting patiently. Is this for the hands that you go So if it is a mobility issue, if they have mobility to be gotten, so if they, you can have soft tissue restriction, you can have just instability protective guarding restriction, or you can have labrum acetabulum. If there ain't any more to get, then you're, you're not gonna wanna be training that because you're just impinging it, you know that. Um, more hip mobility is always better. So if you can do it, it's always better. I'm not gonna show you the exercises, but the muscles that block the squat, that for, other than the erector spine that we mentioned and I'll demo later on, what muscles best block hip flexion in the squat? What do you need to stretch out to improve your hip mobility for flexion in the squat better? You went to adductors first, you fucking asshole. Um, adductors, right? Do the glutes do it? 
no, no one stretches it out. He's a weird BJJ guy. He's like, you know, uh, no one really stretches those out. They do like, oh, they'll say hamstrings, they help. They'll say uh, glutes, they help. The adductor magnus, if, when you open that up, it is just like lights out. People just go like, holy crap. So a hockey stretch or um, the frog stretch is really, really good just to kind of open that up. You just have to look that up, you don't have time to show it. But loosen up the adductors will make a humongous difference. Thank you. You can do that kind of a thing. You can do the weird lift the heels off. All the variations are great. But loosening up the adductors is going to be the biggest bang for your buck. One